name is Rakaya Ann. I'm 18 years old. I'm a Bungla and Adyamatna woman. I've been living in Kalanyala all my life. My favourite thing about being a traditional owner is having a strong connection to my culture, family, the land and the sea. Nyanyabu, Nagadu, Kalanyala, Bangala, Mirana, Yuari, Mabu. Nyanyabu, Nagadu, Bangala, Yuari, Yadna, Wadna. Indu. We would like to welcome you to Port Lincoln, the traditional lands of the Bungalow people, to share respects to our elders past and present, to acknowledge that their spiritual and cultural beliefs are still important to the Bungalow descendants today. Thank you. So we never sat and talked about this. It's been many, many years. There was only over the last, I guess, 10 years, maybe, that we started to sort of talk a bit more about it. And so we never really, really got a full story of um, our family group that was taken. It was uh, my cousin Howard and David, the two brothers, the Annie Elba's children. It was Brenton, myself, Elizabeth, and Arthur John um, from my mum. We lived in Port Lincoln, a place at that time, you know it as Mellie Park today, but it was known as the jungle back in the day. swamp, they call it. We used to live on rafts there when I was a young fellow in that day. Going up to Salt Creek, where the new marina they built there, you had to sort of wait till the tide goes out before you get across it to go to Billy Lodge Point. It trekked all these periwinkles and whatever you could find on the rocks, you know, sometimes it like we find our mussels. We lived about oh, 102 metres from the, the old original Nutty Park Mence. Down there we had a tin house. You know, like we had, I don't know how we had these tins. They were probably roped together or something. And they were tin things to keep the cold out and they had ashen bags for the window. And no running water. No hot and cold shower. I don't know how we survived, but we survived. But you know, the only thing we had, we had each other. But the more things I remember is when after that public outcry, you know, to the conditions they saw us, um, especially me and my cousin sitting on the roof. We was hiding from them for a while, eh, bro? And we got scared every time we seen them cars because our mothers were crying. Mum used to hide me 
and a blanket just got in town, just got in bits and pieces from the butchers. And I'd hide under the house with the dogs. We were outcasts. Yeah, fair skin, Aboriginal people. We had all our family around us. So we just lived a normal life. We was playing mud pies and Dad was playing slingshots. He knew how to make slingshots, eh, bro? And our mothers were inside and um, they seen the welfare car coming. So they started crying and telling us to run. So David was the faster runner than me. He started running and I tried to keep up with him. The welfare people, they caught me and put me in the back of the car and I started screaming and carrying on and David heard me and he walked back to the car and jumped in the car with me. Your turn, bro. You can feel that other part in front of you. Well, I see my sisters now getting chucked in, so I don't know where else to go, so I just went back and jumped in with them. How old were you, bro? How old was Lucy? How old were you? I was nine. I was going on to five. I think I just turned five. I was at school. I was nine years old, the bell had gone, I was packing my case and the next thing I saw, the headmaster coming down with a strange white man I didn't know. The strange man just said to me, look, you can go in the car and wait if you like. So I did that and when I got out to the car, I saw my little sister Elizabeth and my cousin David. They were sitting in the back seat. They took us back to our mother's house. My mother was there, uh, my auntie Elva, which was David's um, mother, and my auntie Pam. And my little brother, John, was there. He was only about two at the time. And the man wanted to get John and, and the aunties and my mum, and that was screaming and shouting. I mean, I still remember it to this day. It's just, it's, it's really, um, to recollect that scene is really heartbreaking. Uh, so we were crying and screaming and shouting, you know. We were confused, we didn't know what was going on. And we were wondering why our mothers and our aunties were shouting and screaming and upset. And we had no idea. We were kids and they took us down to the police station. I remember Howard telling me, saying that we actually drove down to Mallee Park and he was there. I was uh, playing around where the old people were sitting on the, the hill, just uh, overlooking Mallee Park. And uh, we saw a black car with their other members of their, our family in the back. I was looking down the pathway where I wanted to run away into the scrub because they wouldn't catch me. And, uh, but when I saw my brothers and my other members of my family sitting in the car, I was caught between the two. I wanted to run, but I couldn't, and uh, so I stayed. And there were uh, people were screaming and shouting, and uh, and the welfare and the police put us in the in the car because I was the oldest one, and. Uh, and uh, my other cousin was, uh, they put us in the cell for the night. I was a normal child going to school regularly. My world was shattered that one cold day when they rounded me and my family up and locked us elder children in a police cell with a drunken criminal. That was the beginning of trauma and fear. Fear of the police, fear of the welfare and fear of white people in general. We were snatched from school and the younger children from the Mallee Park area and our parents. This fear, anger, distrust and dislike of authority was instilled in me from then till this very day. But I had to cope with these feelings and hide it within my soul or this would lead to other problems in life. Unless one has been through this fear and trauma, only one can assume how you felt. They took us from freedom to imprisonment.
the older brothers were taken to jail. Yeah, and I think we went with the policewoman to the house. We went to court the next day and uh, our mums were down at the courthouse and uh, and that was when uh, we heard that we were um, in charge with neglect and um, then uh, we were uh, sent away for safekeeping. Then the next thing we knew we was heading down to the True Bridge and we was put onto the True Bridge. I remember standing up the top there, we were standing at the top and our mothers and they were down the bottom and they were crying. And even then, just as a nine year old, just didn't, still didn't know the impact of what was happening. Then we waved, all excited for this boat ride, still not really fully understanding and comprehending what was going on. The True Bridge was a freight boat, it wasn't a very nice boat. But we was on that um, boat with our brothers and other sister. And um, I remember that trip because I was seasick all the way. We was all in shock because we were coming to a strange place. We didn't, uh, first time we ever been into a city, first mm. time we ever been on a boat, first time to Adelaide and seen all the lights and the uh, high buildings, skyscrapers, and we were just uh, in shock. The boys went to Glendor and Wendana. We went to Wendana first. Wendana. Yeah, the deep police and all that. And, it, and us girls went to Seaforth, plus our young, my younger brother, because he was still in the court. I think I cried and cried. Really. Never seen so many lights in our life. Tormented us, our soul, you know, yeah, which I reckon was wrong, but they did, you know. But I told them, I told them that I didn't want to stay there anyway, I said I was kidnapped, you know, and that's how I felt about it. Yeah. I was pretty close to them, the oldies. We were there, pride and joy to do that. You know, it was really, it was just very strange because everywhere you went it was doors and doors were locked behind you and then when we went to have dinner I remember my little brother and sister just wouldn't eat they were just upset wanting mum and uh, it was really really hard because I had to become the mother substitute for them because when we were put into rooms, you only had so many girls to a dormitory and the doors were locked. And John being small was on the other other side in the, into the children's ward. And um, when he'd cry and get upset, I had to go in. And no, Elizabeth was there too because she was still pretty young. I had to go in, I had to settle them down because they couldn't settle them down. And, that was my role all the way through, being in the home, settling them down and making sure they were okay. I asked to move from where I was in the dormitory up to another, it was like an outside dormitory where I could open, lift the window up, jump out, go across to her room because I'd hear her crying at night. She was terrified because there was no one in the room but her and I would have to go in and put her to sleep because it was just cruel to little, little, kid, little kids sit there like that. So these were the kind of things I had to do while I was in the home to make sure that the little ones were okay. The room where I was staying was called the blue room. That's the bedwetters. And I used to stay in there just wet my bed. I was freaking scared. Everybody else got flustered out except for me and I had to stay in that big dorm by myself. I was scared. I cried for my mum every, every night. And my aunties. 
my uncles, my, my brothers and sisters. Before I got taken away, my auntie said to me at the, at the courthouse, and she shook me up and grabbed my shoulders and looked me in the eye and said, um, and, and said to me, she said, tell them who they are and where they come from. Tell them not to forget us and don't get fostered out or don't get adopted out because you will never ever see us again. I wrote letters every, every week, made it very clear my intentions were to go home. Um, I wanted to go home. We done that religiously every week. John was fostered out. Liz was fostered out and I just, I was there by myself and I just really didn't care anymore. You know, I used to write letters to my mother, but they, they were always censored. I remember the time when Fred came to see us and we, I was playing outside with the kids and I saw him and I said to the girls, that's my brother. Yeah, he'd come to see us. Um, he just wanted to see that we were all right. You know, just seeing him was hard. And then having to say goodbye to him was even harder. Then I'll try and find a way to get you fellas home, you know? He'd wrote, written letters and asked about taking us and having us and that, but they just said no. He had to have a home and everything else and he tried. And I guess I got to the stage where I just, it was just like Kesara. I didn't, I'd sort of lost hope. The only thing kept me going was the fact that I, just, I did write letters to mum and I did get letters even though they were censored. But Brenton used to keep in touch with me all the time. I've, you know, still got a lot of letters, so I've kept them. And that's the only thing that kept my hopes up was that he would let me know how the family was, when somebody got married, when someone passed away. When mum was sick, it was that little bit of something from home, knowing that, hey, the family's OK, and that, you know, sooner or later I'll be able to go home. That hit me, and not even now, I'm getting a bit teary about it. And to think, you know, right then and there, oh, my, my world was shattered. You know, everything, my dream of going home, you know, helping my mum and my brothers and sisters. You know, I did a decent job, but I slipped out of the door, but I never said goodbye to anybody. I decided I'm going home, you know, I'm going to run away. I wouldn't come over and see my mum. Uh, she was so distraught, you know, and crying. Yeah, if you hear all that bring your woman's howl and thing, it's sending something up your spine. And that's how she was wailing. And I said, Mum, I'm home here, you know, I've got to help you, you know. I said, I'm trying to do what I could. And I was about, 13 going on to 14. And she said, no. You know, I said, come and give me a hug, you know, because I want to still one of my brother's love too, you know. But she said, no, you're all right. You always looked after yourself. The rest, the baby sort of thing. And she said, I want them back. And I just started howling again. Oh, you know. My childhood was gone, and I lost my brothers and sisters, and I just felt I'm a outcast, you know? I don't fit in. They don't want me, you know? And I'm one of my childhood friendship. And, uh, you know, you're just so distraught. How could, you know, they don't want me. 